All right, so we're week four. Now, I did send some information on the group discussion board assignment, so if you want to go ahead and get started on that, you can. And then yesterday, there is a review video emailed and a bonus point opportunity. So if you're interested, you can partake. I'm going to get into the week four lesson plan. And there are some review videos in YouTube about the different ailments that we're learning about because this week is the nervous system and the eyes and ears. So that goes well together because those are both our sense organs. I'm going to download my PowerPoint. So for those of you at home online, let's get our uh, ICD-10 coding books out and in front of you and we're going to get ready to code. So we do have a question about question 17 in the review. So I will take a look at that today after we get through our lesson. And okay, here we go. So we're gonna start with chapter nine, the nervous system. So different conditions coded here include Alzheimer's. We've heard of that. We probably know somebody with that. Cerebral palsy, meningitis, or inflammation of the meninges, Parkinson's, nerve disorders, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, migraine, which is what I have, and general pain, just general pain, because that is a side effect of nerve stimulation. Some of the guidelines in this system, it's chapter six in the guidelines, diseases of the nervous system, um, the biggest one is the dominant and non-dominant sides. If you're a right-hand dominant or a left-hand dominant, because uh, certain conditions want to code, what is the patient's dominant side? Is their dominant side effective? So there's some guidelines for how you would come to that conclusion if it's not documented. So the guideline states codes from G category G81 and G83, um, monoplegia, identify whether it's non-dominant or dominant side affected. Should the affected side be documented but not specified as dominant or non-dominant? And the system doesn't indicate a default. Code selection would be for ambidextrous patients, their default is dominant because they use both sides. So, I mean, I don't really know very many ambidextrous people, but potentially that could apply. If the left side is affected, it's non-dominant, and right side is dominant. So that's kind of, uh, we all, the defaults to the right side anyhow for most of life for a left-handed person. But this is if it's not documented. If it says the patient's left side is affected, but it doesn't say it's their dominant side, we're going to make this assumption through the guidelines. So if you're right-handed, your right side of your body is considered your dominant. If you're left-handed, the left side is dominant. And those who use both hands equally are ambidextrous. If you don't know, if it's not documented, we're going to assume um, if it's the right side, it's the dominant side. All right, so again, guidelines direct you for documentation states right side is directed, report is dominant. If the left side is affected, report is non-dominant. This is if it's not specified. Of course, you would probably be better off to ask your physician what um, information should be on there or to clarify. So the nervous system, we have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cords. So this is where all the messaging and, and transmission of impulses take place. Then our peripheral nerves is our cranial nerves and spinal nerves. So they branch out to help us control all of our body. Neurological disorders can be caused by different reasons. Genetics, congenital or present at birth, trauma or disease. Uh, some of the dysfunction with the nervous system interferes with activities of daily living. And this was a table from our book. Uh, so some of these activities would include hygiene, dressing, eating, feeding, functional mobility, um, and et cetera. Continuing on with conditions, encephalitis, inflammation of the brain tissue, or myelitis, inflammation of the spinal cord, 
or intracranial abscess, different inflammatory diseases of the central nervous system. Specific details of the cause may lead you to a different code or require a second code. So meningitis is a good example. Uh, it's inflammatory disease, and you must know more than the fact that the patient is diagnosed with the meningitis. It's going to be caused by either a virus or bacterial invader that you'll want to identify from your documentation. So it could be a virus like enterovirus, herpes zoster, or a bacterial an infection like E. coli, pneumococcus, staphylococcus. So we want to capture the cause of these conditions. What is the infectious agent? Because as we keep reiterating as coders, we are researchers. Uh, some nervous system conditions affect the central nervous system are from genetics or degeneration, Alzheimer's disease. Usually that starts with a um, diagnosis of general dementia and it progresses. Pain management, neurologists are among healthcare professionals that treat pain and neurologic conditions, and they specialize in pain management. So category G89, if we want to go ahead and turn to that in our tabular, G89. So this is just for general pain, for category G89. When we turn to that, um, it's going to have some information. There's lots of excludes at one and two notes on this category. And there's a code also for any psychological factors associated with the pain. And we see the code breaks down. Um, we start at G8 9.0. There's central pain, acute pain due to trauma or post thoracotomy, post procedure. Did you have a thoracotomy, Gene? Have you? Did you get an incision when you had your heart attack? You, they didn't cut you. Oh, okay. The thoracotomies are very painful. After your father had that. Um, so that could be a, a possibility where a patient comes in just for pain management due to that condition. Uh, chronic pain, which is pain that is consistent over a longer period of time. So these are just general codes used as the principal diagnosis when a patient just comes for pain management. And an example of a pain scale that might be used in a clinical setting, uh, it's very subjective. It, it could be different from one person to the next, but this is kind of a guideline for a provider to get an idea of how much pain a patient is, is, is in, so they know what treatment or how to proceed with the uh, treatment plan. Uh, let's see, post-procedural pain, that's like the thoracotomy that we talked about. Uh, Site-specific pain, there is category G89, it's not elsewhere classified, so it's not site-specific. Anatomical site-specific codes do exist. They largely come from the M category, from the musculoskeletal system. So we see some examples, M54.5, lower back pain, pain in the left arm, pain in the left foot. So if it's just a general pain diagnosis, that's what category G89 covers, because there are specific types of pain. And let's code it. So Bruce, he went to, on a trip, and now he has a diagnosis of intracranial epidural abscess caused by enterococcus. All right, so intracranial epidural abscess caused by enterococcus. Let's start by going to our index of diseases and injuries, and we're going to look up the word abscess, and then under abscess, we're going to find intracranial. So I'll give us a moment here.
So when you look up in the index, we're going to get code G06.0. So our next step is to look this code up in our tabular list. So we go to G06.0 and it is intracranial abscess and granuloma. And there's some descriptors under that that include um, anything covered under this condition. It can also be known as cerebral abscess, um, embolic, intracranial abscess, epidural abscess, or granuloma. We, so we did have an intracranial epidermal abscess. But we need to go back a little bit farther to category G06 where it starts. There is a use additional code for B95 to B97 to identify the infectious agent. And that was caused by enterococcus. And I had a hard time finding enterococcus in the index. Now there's another way you could probably look this up. If you did like enterococcus ICD-10 in a Google search, it would give you a hit on the ICD-10 data website as to what code matches it. But the code for the G06 has that use additional note that does direct us to category B95 to B97. And, and it's, these are short categories. So let's go ahead and turn to that section in the tabular. So we're going to go to B95 to B97. And you're going to review the code description in these categories to find enterococcus. So if you start at B95, it's just a few codes down in that category. So B95.0 is streptococcus group A. B95.1 is streptococcus group B. And B95.2 is enterococcus as cause of diseases uh, classified elsewhere. So our condition was caused by enterococcus. So B95.2 will fit our description. And that gives us these two codes. So again, we have to always go to the tabular list. And we saw a use additional code note that prompted us to find to code that cause. Because again, we want to make sure we capture everything about this condition and where it starts, where it originates, so we can study it. Just double checking on my class here, making sure my recording's going. <laughs> I had I didn't have my screen on yesterday. I was doing class, didn't even record the screen for medical terminology class. So doesn't hurt to double check for sure. All right, so that was our first let's code it. And I'm going to skip back up to where we were at. That one wasn't too bad. And we go to our next one. Yes. So you always, like in our code, does the cult always go last? Yeah. Um, that's um, not. not necessarily, and it will direct you, the book will actually direct you if there's something to code first. Okay. It will say, because our note said code also, okay. so you would add that after the main uh, diagnoses, but sometimes it will direct you to say code first, but the book is going to give you that information. That's a good question. All right, we got JJ Fletcher. She is diagnosed with late onset Alzheimer's disease. Very unfortunate condition to have. So now we will go back to our index and we're going to look up Alzheimer's. I 
And you're going to get a note when you look up Alzheimer's, and it's already on the slide here, that will say C, disease, and then Alzheimer's. So our index is even going to give us hints on where we need to go. So we start with looking up just Alzheimer's. It's going to have a note in our index that will say C, disease, and then Alzheimer's. So now we're looking for disease and then Alzheimer's. And from there, we want to find late onset. And what we see in the index looks like this, G30.1. And then in brackets, we have F02.80. So this is alerting us that there is going to be two codes in this scenario. G30.1 would be the first listed code. And our next step is to find G30.1 in our tabular list. So now we're going to turn to G30.1. And when we go to G30.1, we still need to go back to category G30. And there is a notation here, use additional code to identify uh, delirium, if applicable, dementia without behavioral disturbance, and dementia with behavioral disturbance. So going back to our scenario, we just have, she's, she's just coming in and she's been diagnosed, and we're not discussing any behavioral disturbances in this scenario. So... Dementia without behavioral disturbances is F02.80, which is what we found in our index as well. So it defaults to without behavioral um, disturbances. If there was a behavioral disturbance, we would use the different code. And now we know our first code is going to be G30.1. Now we go to category F02 to look into F02.80, the code. Always going through my alphabet here. And there's a lot of code first notes on this category for F02. We're going to see code first, uh, the underlying physiological condition, and that's not an option. That's an ab that's absolute requirement when it says that. So you do have to have a first condition coded, which ours is Alzheimer's. So we are correctly coding this. So our two codes for this scenario, G30.1 followed by F02.80. Okay, Eric Springer is diagnosed with communicating hydrocephalus. So he's got some water on the brain. All right, let's go back to our index of diseases and injuries. And we are going to look up hydrocephalus. And then from hydrocephalus, we want to find communicating. So 
So our code for this diagnosis is G91.0. So we go back to our tabular. We're going to find code G91.0. And we want to go back to category G91 and be sure to read any pertinent notes on this scenario. So G91 does have an includes node acquired hydrocephalus. There are some excludes one notes, uh, Arnold, Chiari syndrome, congenital hydrocephalus, spina bifida with hydrocephalus. So these are saying that uh, anything from code one category is not coded on the same claim with anything on those excludes one notes. But luckily, none of this applies to our scenario, so we get by with just one code, G91.0. All right, now we're going to move on into the I. So it is incredibly complex, especially if you start to study the anatomy of it and the muscles and all of the parts of the eye. There are two sockets in the skull. They're known as the orbit or the eye sockets. And the, common, uh, the organ commonly referred to as the eye consists of the actual eyeball itself, optic nerves, muscles, and a lacrimal system, which is to produce tears. Uh, different parts of the eyes, we have the sclera, which is the protective covering shown in our picture. And the cornea is the portion of the sclera at the medial or media, middle part of the eyeball, middle. Our pupils, the black center of the eye, and then the retina is an area in the back of the eye that has the nerve endings and is responsible for processing our visual images and sensory input to turn those into visual images. It's basically like a movie projector. We have the lens, and accommodation is part of an uh, exam a doctor does. He, he checks on the eyes and will mention something about accommodation, changes shape to see objects both near and far. Then the vitreous chamber is basically a gel-filled area. It's a gel-filled fluid. It, too, can have detachment issues. The extraocular muscles. There are diagrams of this. Um, I believe when we get to CPT, it gets a little bit confusing to code these type of procedures, but they do have nice diagrams like this one that shows where the muscles are at. So some procedures can be done are affecting just these particular muscles. There's also a procedure known as a nucleation or complete removal of the eyeball. And there's different types of glands in the eyelids. Different abbreviations. These are kind of odd, um, and it's probably from like a Latin organ, but this is how sometimes visual exams are documented. Our patients seeing an ophthalmologist might have this documented. So right eye, left eye, accommodation. Perla, that's part of a um, exam a doctor might do in the, on one of the body systems. Different diseases of the eye can include blepharitis or inflammation of the eyelid. And that's a good medical term. Blepher means eye. And you wouldn't think that doesn't sound like it has anything to do with the eye. Dracryocystitis, inflammation of the lacrimal gland. And those are the, the, the glands in the um, corner of the eye that produces our tears. I remember that because CRI, cry, lacrimal glands. Proptosis, or bulging of the eyelid, also known as ex, exo, exophthalmosis. Gosh, it's hard to spell ophthalmology or anything with this body system. But that's when the eyeball can bulge out completely of its socket. Conjunctivitis, I bet you, you deal with that, Thomasina. Pink eye <laughs> with the schools. Um, the, I remember having pink eye one time in my 20s. And it was miserable. It, it's actually a medical term known as conjunctivitis. We have pterygium, which is a triangular-shaped growth on the corneal tissue. Keratitis, or inflammation 
of the cor uh, cornea and corneal dystrophy, growth of abnormal tissue. So that's a good medical term. Dystrophy means bad growth, basically. Cataracts, we're familiar with this condition, clouding of the lens. So usually they do a procedure to suck those out like a vacuum. You can see in the picture there, the lens crowded, clouded by a cat, cataract. I want to say cat, cat, Cadillac. <laughs> I want to say Cadillac. Uh, retinal detachment. This is a very serious issue. So um, once this detaches from the eyeball, you can go blind. Glycoma. So this is from pressure flow. Too much pressure building up in the eyeball causing visual restraints. Not like a cataract, which is a cloudy lens. And it can be categorized as open angle and closed angle in its description. Eye examinations, I find this interesting, can reveal signs of diabetes, hypertension, lupus, malignancies, and other cardiovascular concerns. Usually a, a physician can just look right into the eye directly and be able to tell if everything's nice and normal. Diabetic retinopathy, we talked about diabetes last week and all of the bad manifestations that come with it. So diabetic retinopathy causes damage to the blood vessels in the retina. So symptoms include blurry or double vision, flashing lights, blank spots, dark or floating spots, floaters. Anybody have eye floaters? I have them. They, they are they're hard to get used to at first. I just got to ignore them. I have them right now. <laughs> Hypertensive retinopathy. Uh, you know, when you have hypertension, the blood goes through your veins at such force um, that force is what causes damage, like to the kidneys or the retina. And that was our summary of the eyes. Okay, so we have on our coded scenario, Arnie has confirmed streptococcus pneumoniae as a pathogen for his diagnosis of orbital cellulitis of the right eye. So he has orbital cellulitis in the right eye due to streptococcus pneumonia. So now we're going to go to our index again, and we're going to look up cellulitis and then orbital. And we'll see when we look that up, H05.01, it has a little check mark beside of the code. And when it's in the index like that, that indicates we have to have some more added to this code. It needs more digits added to it. So now we go to the tabular list. And we're going to look up H05.01. So the eye and the ear share a chapter here on the ICD-10 code book. First part of the H category is for the eye. So we have H05.01, cellulitis of orbit. We know it was the right eye that was affected. And we have to go back to category H05 to read any pertinent notes that would apply to the scenario. It just has one, excludes one note for congenital malformation of orbit. So to complete this code, we have H05.011. But note that this particular code category doesn't have any used additional code notes. But yet we do know that streptococcus pneumonia 
was the cause. So we want to go ahead and capture that. So we have our first code. Now we go back to the index and we're going to look up Streptococcus. And this was actually in the index. <laughs> So we go to the index, we look up streptococcus, and then pneumonia, and it's going to give us code B95.3. So it still falls into that B95 to B97 category of infectious diseases. And our last step, we turn to B95.3 in the tabular. We can skip that for now, just for sake of time. But the full coding of this scenario is H05.011 and B95.3. What are you? Which one are you looking? You look up Streptococcus first, then pneumonia. Yes, yes. Yeah, because actual pneumonia probably is, it comes from the respiratory system. So we're capturing our pathogen. And we're going to finish up with the auditory system in the ears. So you can see just as complex as an anatomical structure as the eyes. We have the external ear, which includes the pinea the outside lobe of the ear, the earlobe itself, and the external ear canal for uh, auditory processing. The middle ear transmits sound waves from the eardrum to the inner ear. So, so we got the external ear, middle ear, and then the inner ear. So in the middle ear, vibrations pass through what's called the tympanic cavity. I always think of a big timpani drums if you think of like an orchestra. There's three different bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. That sound goes through to be structured for us to hear it and process. Then the inner ear is the innermost part of the auditory canal. And we see the cochlea. It looks like a shell. Hearing loss, very common ailment. Um, from this category. So there's different reasons for hearing loss, genetic or congenital reasonings, psychogenic reasonings um, due to certain diseases or ailments. Sometimes meningitis has um, a negative effect with hearing, especially for young children. Trauma or external causes. Going to a really loud rock concert is, is, can have some negative side effects. One in six adults have hearing loss. So that's one of the most common physical conditions faced, almost 750 million adults. Um, diagnostic testing can be done for addressing hearing issues. So there's a general screening test, tuning fork test, or pure tone hearing test. Y'all probably took something like this in grade school, probably. Uh, different ailments or dysfunctions of the ears. Otitis media, very common inflammation of the middle ear. That's how that word is pronounced, otitis. Very common among kids. Uh, endic hydrops or Meniere's disease, dysfunction of the labyrinth. You can see in that picture there, a labyrinth is a contrapture of the ear. And it looks just like a labyrinth, very complex bone structure. Otosclerosis, a condition of growth of spongy bone in the otic capsule. You see there the bony growth. Tumors of the ear canal and cochlear implants. These are pretty uh, revolutionary, especially for individuals that are deaf, completely deaf. It allows them to you know, experience the world of sound. And these are electronic devices and um, worn on the outside of the ear also um, Surgeries done on the inside of the ear as well. 
but very common treatment option. And that's our summary. All right. So we're back to Cody. <laughs> Galinda was diagnosed with acute perichondritis of the left pina. And perichondritis, pay attention to how that word, word is spelled because this uh, sometimes trips me up when I look for stuff in the index because I don't want to put that H in there for chondritis. So we go back to our diseases index and we're going to, okay, so if we look at perichondritis, it's going to say C, perichondritis ear. So that's where we want to go. We want to find perichondritis and then ear. And this was acute perichondritis. So the first thing we look up is just perichondritis. Right? Yes. And it, it actually there is uh, the word penia is there, but it just says C perichondritis ear. So we would start with perichondritis, then we go to pina, and it tells us to go to ear. So perichondritis, ear, and it was acute. So we get H61.01. And now we turn to our tabular, so we're going to look up H61.01. And what ear was affected? It was the left. I'm just going to double check in my left pina. Okay. So it was the left ear. So that gives us a full code of H61.012. Acute perichondritis of the left external ear. We want to go back to category H61 and check for any notations, which there's not in this code category. There's not any excludes one or two notes. There's not any code first or code also notes. But there are some includes notes. I guess it starts under H61.0, though. So our full code for this scenario, H61.012. All right. That one was pretty easy to get through. Very good. Very good, Sean. I'm glad you was getting these codes with us. So that is it for the lecture review. Um, just a few things. I do have an updated self-check worksheet that we're going to work on today. So that's what we're going to do with the rest of class, Tom. And so for those of you online, if you want to print this off, you can. It does include the answers. And you can also do the self-check in Blackboard. I do want to encourage you to check out the different videos because we want to learn about different conditions. And YouTube is the best. And we have our group discussion assignment coming up. So right up here on the very top of Blackboard, the little um, speech bubble link takes us to group discussion one. And then you guys have got assigned topics. I'm going to click here and take a look. So you will find your group number and your assigned topic. And I think this isn't coming up due for maybe another week or two, October 2nd. So we got some time. So that is it for today. We have our chapter 9, 10, 11 review and quiz assignment. And if anything else comes up, feel free to send me a question. Let me know because um, things can go wonky all the time. So um, it never hurts to double check. All right. I'm going to stop.